All right, well, we're at two minutes after uh, the point of beginning. So I will say a few welcome remarks here and that will allow other folks to leave their previous meeting and join us here. So welcome. My name is Catherine. I'm with the Center for Ideas and Society. And we were so honored and pleased to have the opportunity to co-sponsor this talk as part of our Hot Off the Presses series. That's a series, if you're not familiar with it, that features book talks with Chaz faculty who have recently published a work. So we're very excited to partner with the Department of English on this talk. And we're very excited to welcome you here today. And so at the beginning here, before I hand things over for the event proper, I just want to ask you to join with me in acknowledging that the land in and around UC Riverside and the places where we live and work has been cared for and tended and honored and respected by many people, the first peoples in this area. I'm referring, of course, to the Kuiya, the Tongva, the Serrano peoples, the Luisenia peoples. And we have the responsibility and the honor to join with them, both to acknowledge our debt to their past caretaking, to co-labor and honor in the present, and then an obligation and a responsibility to carry that labor and respect forward into the future. And so we just acknowledge that here together before we begin. So without further ado, I will hand things over to the master of ceremonies, John Gannam. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is John Gannam, and I am representing the English Department Committee on Colloquia. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'll just introduce our speakers very briefly, and we will plunge immediately into the program uh, at the end of uh, their 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes or so. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, just unmute and ask a question. If you would prefer uh, me to um, uh, funnel the questions, feel free to enter your questions in chat when we the chat uh, uh, box down below uh, as soon as we uh, finish with the uh, actual formal presentation and move on to questions and answers. Uh, uh, again, a very brief introduction since I think you all are here because you know everyone involved. Uh, David Lloyd, Distinguished Professor of English and Chair of the English Department at UC Riverside, uh, one of the leading international figures in post-colonial studies and Irish literature, uh, uh, he, uh, a long, long series of books and accomplishments, and the most recent, of course, the edition uh, of uh, Alfred Artiego's uh, uh And uh, uh, he will be uh, in dialogue, uh, as, as we usually do with Hot Off the Press, uh, 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 with, with uh, Vicky Rodriguez from Media and Cultural Studies at UCR, uh, author of uh, Next of Kin, uh, The Family and Chicano Cultural Politics from Duke University, uh, an award-winning book, and uh, presently working on several other books. He is uh, very uh, active and prominent in several different fields. Uh, he co-edited a special issue of GLQ. Uh, his work has appeared in social texts. American Literary History, Biography, American Quarterly, uh, and a number, a number of um, uh, very influential uh, anthologies. Uh, in 2019, he received the Yarborough Mentoring Award uh, of the American Studies Association. And my favorite accomplishment is, if you've never listened to his KUCR uh, radio program, you will be educated in... Uh, 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 byways of rock music that you pr may not remember or that you probably uh, need to be reminded about. Uh, and so I will turn things now uh, over to, to David and Ricky, take it away. Thank you, John, for that really generous introduction. And thanks also to Catherine um, for that really full and deeply relevant land acknowledgement, as we'll be talking about Alfred Arteaga was a poet whose work honors um, the indigenous inheritance of the United States and of Mexico. 
uh, largely in the form of his deep investment in the legacy of Aztec and Mayan culture and his use of the Nahua language um, in, in much of his writing. And we'll, we'll talk more about that momentarily. And I want to thank uh, Ricky Rodriguez for joining me in what will at least start as a dialogue between the two of us and hopefully open out to dialogue uh, with all of you. And I wanna welcome everybody here and thank you all for adding yet another Zoom to uh, your busy schedule of Zoom meetings. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate that we are being joined at least as far as I know by people from beyond UCR as far away as Buenos Aires and Berkeley, California. And uh, it's, it's really great. And once again, along with the dialogical form that we're taking, that uh, widespread attendance is actually also in the spirit of Alfred's work. For those of you who don't know his work or his life, Alfred uh, was born in uh, East LA actually, and also lived in Whittier and Montebello um, before moving north to have a career that took him to San Jose and to Berkeley, as well as further afield to an MFA program in Colombia for a year or two. And so um, in terms of being a California poet, he really does straddle both the south and the north of the state. Beyond that, as we'll be talking about, he was profoundly internationalist in his outlook. He was uh, familiar with both the north of Ireland and with London. He spent time in Berlin, in Barcelona, in Milan, and later in his life also in Japan. So that sense of his presence as a late modernist or perhaps a postmodernist poet with a far-flung international understanding of poetic work uh, he was always deeply interested in the relationship between Europe and the West Coast of the United States that finds its way into virtually every book that he wrote, as far as I'm aware, in some fashion or another. Um, Alfred uh, grew up at a crucial period in Chicano history. He is, I think it's generally acknowledged, one of the leading poets of the Chicano Renaissance between the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, he is also someone who taught and wrote criticism on Chicano literature in ways that are formative for the canon of thinking about what Chicano or Chicanex poetry was doing at that time and what its promises as a multilingual or as he would have said heteroglossic or polylingual uh, language formation in itself. He, uh, after teaching in uh, San Jose, uh, East LA College, he moved north to go to Santa Cruz to do a PhD and uh, there worked both on Renaissance and on Chicano literature simultaneously and was actually in the long legacy of outstanding scholars uh, who have received the President's Post Doctoral Fellowship. After teaching in the University uh, of Houston for three years, he, he came to Berkeley. Um, there he actually taught uh, Shakespeare as well as Chicano literature and uh, was totally conversant with Renaissance literature and Renaissance thinking, as I had to discover um, when I was editing the book, that is something I'll come back to, to shortly. Um, his experience at Berkeley was, to say the least, mixed. Um, he taught very popular courses that I think Ricky will be able to, to talk more about. But uh, in 1996 was denied tenure by the English department. And I mention that not only because of how outrageous that denial of tenure actually was for someone who had an edited book, several volumes of poetry, and a book of essays on Chicano poetry about to appear with Cambridge University Press, but also because it exemplified the extraordinary capacity for misreading that could take place even with a poet 
as militantly committed to dialogism, to hybridity, to heteroglossia as Alfred was. He was accused by at least one of his readers in the review process, one of the internal departmental readers, of having a messianic attitude to poetry that attached him to a kind of blood and soil nationalism. And apart from the fact that such evaluations are actually prohibited in tenure reviews, it marked a singular incapacity to read, which I found very striking at the time as a colleague of Alfred's at Berkeley in those days. Um, Alfred fought a long uh, battle against that denial of tenure. Um, his uh, response to the initial decision is a classic of brevity, terseness, and accuracy that I'm happy to share with anybody who wants to see it. But he finally won that battle at great cost to his health. And one of the reasons, in fact, that we're gathered here together today is that I would imagine I can, I'm not a medical doctor, I don't know, that the stress and tensions of that period precipitated a heart condition that led after several uh, serious hospitalizations to his early death in 2008. Um, during the course of what is, after all, a relatively short writing life, Alfred produced a number of books, each one of which seems to me to push forward the possibilities of poetry in general, let alone of Shikanex poetry. And uh, there's an astonishing curve and development to his work that I hope we'll be able to exemplify in a few moments um, as we read to you a couple of the poems uh, from the volume, which I'm happy to say is a I don't know if you can see it with the bad lighting, but it's a very pretty volume. And I wanna thank Wesleyan University Press for doing such an extraordinary design job, as well as the artist Gronk, who was a friend of Alfred's, who supplied the image on the cover, um, which is called Man Without Desire, and which contains, which will be relevant to you in a minute, a little blue bed. Um, I want to pass over to, to Ricky right now. Ricky, you, you knew Alfred as a teacher, as a mentor, a friend, and a colleague. So you really know, know the man whole, so to speak. And I, I'd love to hear uh, you share with us some of your impressions of him and some of the, the ways in which he may have influenced you yourself. Thank you, David. Uh, before I before I jump in, I just want to thank John for organizing this and Catherine uh, for her support of the event. Um, but uh, yeah, to well, when David and I were talking about this event, um, you know, as we always do when we get together, um, stories of Alfred will always surface, and you know, I'll remember a detail about a you know, a conversation that we had, um, or David will relay um, an anecdote which will um, kind of bring us to laughter. Um, but uh, in, in terms of uh, thinking about how I first got to know him, um, it was his first year as an assistant professor at Berkeley, uh, which coincided with my first year as an undergraduate there. And at the time, um, I guess maybe just to contextualize Berkeley at the moment, uh, the year I came in was the year that Berkeley had its most diverse uh, entering class. Um, and this was when affirmative action was still um, something that was um, seen as beneficial. Um, and I think, you know, as Alfred mentioned, his tenure denial um, is part and parcel of the, the fierce and um, really vicious response to affirmative action. Um, but at that time, uh, there was a, a, a course in the English department titled Other Voices, which a number of faculty in the department had sponsored uh, to showcase the work that was being done on campus by scholars of color, mostly. Um, but also poets. Uh, and one of the presenters at um, the, uh, the weekly uh, event was Alfred, where he read his poetry uh, and presented on his research. And I was just really taken by him because he was so down to earth, very humble, but just absolutely brilliant. And my friend at the time, uh, who's actually still a friend, a co my colleague uh, and friend, Diana Spinoza, uh, said, well, let me introduce you to him. So we walked up to Alfred and you know, of course, I was just really nervous because I was in the presence of someone who was just so absolutely brilliant, but he was very generous and, and just someone that I could immediately connect with. And he um, invited me to lunch the following week. 
uh, at which point, you know, we just kind of hit it off and he asked me what I was interested in. And at the time I started becoming interested in literature, mainly because of the faculty that was at Berkeley at the time, but then also just the, the people there were, that were there, the, my peers, you know, it was a moment where there was so much um, activism and um, people who were writing and, and producing art. And um, a lot of my colleagues today were uh, undergraduates at that time. Um, and I won't give, well, I won't name um, the <laughs> list, but it's a pretty extensive list, you know, that includes people like Dion. Um, Keith Harris was a master's student in the English department. Uh, my colleagues, Sarita C. in uh, Media and Cultural Studies, uh, Viet Nguyen, Catherine Ramirez, who's at UC Santa Cruz. I I'll just stop there because the list, as I said, is, is pretty extensive. So it was a really important moment at the time. And, and for me, Alfred was one of those uh, figures who really helped make um, that moment so important because he served as a mentor for me um, in, in the sense that I was becoming interested in literary studies and, he, and, and also uh, in poetry. And he taught me that I could do both, that one didn't have to come at the expense of the other. And his example uh, was, was one that I took very seriously. Um, and uh, he started telling me about Santa Cruz uh, where he got his PhD and suggested that I apply to the History of Consciousness program, uh, which I had no familiarity with at the time. Uh, but uh, that became my ultimate graduate school destination. Um, and he talked me up to Hayden White and uh, luckily I was admitted. Uh, but if it wasn't for Alfred, I would have never um, found out or, or have been accepted to Santa Cruz. So Alfred was really important in that regard. Uh, but then also now when I think about it, you know, he, he always pushed me to not give up writing poetry. And uh, lately I've come back to that after uh, pretty much devoting my entire um, career to uh, scholarly writing. Um, and then kind of seeing how the two are really inextricably connected. Uh, that. I can't really um, write scholarly work without writing poetry. Um, and so I really owe that to him. Uh, and in that regard, in terms of uh, poetry uh, and then maybe uh, contextualizing it within um, his scholarly work, um, I'm wondering if you could maybe talk, David, about um, the editing process, what it was like to, to go back and, and read Alfred's work um, and think about it. Um, uh, as a as a as a body of uh, of work that he had produced over a number of years. Well, let, let me say for a start that um, I hope the volume that I've managed to pull together um, is just a beginning. Um, I made the editorial decision primarily to focus on the work that Alfred had published uh, in his lifetime. There are a few additional things, but not very much. Um, I made that decision because I felt like in honoring Alfred's own work, um, that it was important not to presume to publish things that he might not have felt were ready to be published. Um, however, um, with a, a wonderful undergraduate research assistant, Diana Echeverria, who I want to salute and thank here today, I managed to compile a list of all the poems that were collected both in the volumes or that had been published in other forms. In addition, um, Ricky managed to uh, put me back in touch with another uh, student of Alfred's, but also as so often with, with Alfred, fellow poet and, and peer in a certain respect. I mean, his, his sense of the democracy of writing was deep. And Carolina Gonzalez, who was a graduate student, uh, more or less at the same time, what I think of as having been extraordinary golden years in, in Berkeley, uh, also had produced a series of cartas or, or letters with Alfred in the early 90s, around the same time as Ricky was talking about. And I managed to, to locate her and, and get her to share with me uh, the exchange that they had produced of which uh, only Alfred's side was actually published in the books. So we added that. And I also want to salute the presence here today of Anna Kazumi Stahl, a wonderful Spanish language writer who was also in Berkeley at that time, 
because included at the end of the book are, along with the, the work with Carolina, is a collaborative poem that the three of us wrote together one day using the, the French surrealist exquisite corpse mode of, of writing, where each writes two lines and sends on the second of those two lines to the next person in order. So you kind of blindly assemble a poem together. It's great to see you here, Anna, and thanks for being in the book. So, um, the editing process was really the assembly of the um, five or six books, uh, one posthumous, the rest published during his lifetime. I say five or six because there's actually some overlap between work that was published as, as chapbooks and work that was collected in, in more formal volumes. It was, I have to say, a work of both love and mourning over two years. Um, love because Alfred was a friend and was taken away from us too soon, uh, mourning because he died before his time and because he died under circumstances or after circumstances that, that should never have happened. So it was, it was an interesting task. It was a bit unlike uh, perhaps what it would be like to, to edit a volume of John Keats or something because his presence was very live. And as I see in the dialogue, Alfred Presente, um, I felt that my task was not to overload the books that we were gathering in this volume with too much apparatus. But Alfred had provided to his first volume, Cantos, um, which came out in 1991, a set of notes at the back that were partly teasing, uh, I think rather like the Wasteland notes and perhaps riffing on those a little incomplete. But since he'd started that process, it seemed to make sense to continue it. And so one of the things I had to do was complete those notes in cantos, which is probably what took me most of the summer in which I was doing that work, um, because Alfred's erudition was really extraordinary. I found myself having to look for the edition of John Donne from which he quotes. I found myself having to um, get at least familiar with the outlines of Nahuatl in order to be able to identify Nahuatl words and then find their meanings and then try to recompose how Alfred had put them together. I found myself having to read the 17th century uh, nun and poet uh, of enormous repute in the New, uh, New World Spanish uh, language poetry, who's Sor Juana. So I found myself pulling down volumes of that. Much to my surprise, I found myself having to go back to a medieval Spanish epic in order to identify certain citations um, that Alfred had thrown in casually because, of course, he was writing an epic. And this romance poem uh, is really the beginning of, of Spanish epic poetry about and interestingly, of course, about the expulsion of the Moors from the Spanish uh, peninsula. That gives you some idea um, of the variety of his work. There's also a figure that I'm hoping that one day someone will illuminate for me, a Quebecois poet who died very young called Marie Huguet, who appears in virtually every volume of Alfred's. And I have yet to establish what connection there may have been or what drew him so obsessively to her work that comes back and back and back. So hopefully future editors and critics of Alfred's work will find that. But in addition to, to completing the notes for the cantos, I decided to add short explanatory and contextualizing notes to other volumes. And in the course of that, uh, had wonderful help from his daughter, Soshi, who has in her possession most of Alfred's papers. And in rooting through that, I made all kinds of discoveries, um, including the fact that one of the chief figures who will be mentioned in a poem I read from his volume, Frozen Accident, which is a kind of descent into the underworld with a Virgilian guide who's also based on Aztec notions of the underworld and the guides that take you down through it. Um, there's a character called Sheritzin, and uh, I had wondered where Sherry Tsin might have come from. 
And in his hand scrawled notes that I found for this poem, I was able to actually establish that Sheritzin is based on the well-known Shikana poet, Sheri Moraga. So there were lovely little, little truvais like that, that were, where you stumbled on something that was both a confirmation and also an opening out into one's sense of how deeply integrated Alfred was with a community of poets who meant so much to him. The other person I discovered lurking around in that volume um, is the, the wonderful San Francisco-based poet and translator Norma Cole, who actually is the, uh, through a, a certain anagrammatic play of Alfred's, uh, turns into Lola Ark uh, in, the, in the final segment of that volume, Frozen Accident. There are many such, such really felicitous discoveries, um, including just by coincidence, discovering that he knew the work and probably knew the person of an Irish friend of mine who teaches in Barcelona. Anyway, so <laughs> ranging from that sense of love and mourning to a sense of just the expansion out that Alfred delivers to us both in his writing and of course in our memories of him as a person, the editing I have to say has been an astonishing privilege, one of the greatest privileges I've had in my life uh, working as a scholar and with many poets. But um, Ricky, I think maybe it's time to, to read some poems from sure, so that people get a sense. Yeah. Well, we'd agreed that, that I would start by reading a poem from his first volume, Cantos. Um, Cantos is a very deliberate attempt to sketch. I, th I think one should say sketch because Alfred was not really interested in producing an epic in, in a kind of Poundian sense, but he was interested in thinking about what a poem of foundation would look like for a Chicano poetics. Uh, and as a result, what he produces is a series of poems that follow his own trajectory moving between California and mostly Europe. Um, there's a very arch poem that also is full of swerve and swagger that I thought I would select from this volume to read. I remember reading it in manuscript and being blown away and also very amused by it um, when he shared that with me. It's called The Small Sea of Europe. Um, the small C is spelled S-E-A, not C, with a, um, but of course it's, it's a play on that too. It begins in a somewhat arch way with a, an epigraph from Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak's famous essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, which of course is one of the questions that the whole volume is asking. Can, can the subaltern Shikanex subject speak uh, and be recognized? And of course, his experience going through tenure at Berkeley proved to him that the Shikanex certainly could speak, but might not be understood at all. So the, the citation from Spivak goes, at the end of the 18th century, Hindu law, insofar as it can be described as a unitary system, operated in terms of four texts that staged a four-part episteme defined by the subject's use of memory. And here come three, uh, four Sanskrit words. Shruti, the heard. Smriti, the remembered. Sastra, the learned from another. And Vyavahara, the performed in exchange. And Alfred writes, in Europe's small sea, a system of exchange, forms of life and motion in sign. The case in point, Verkehr. Verkehr is German word meaning traffic. Verkehr, quote, the motion of women, of slaves, in sleek congested automobiles, trunks with drugs. Verkehr, from the Sanskrit, small sea, via Vahara, performance traffic, former act of transformation and exchange. Ecos escritos, sruti, smriti, sastra, three sisters in myth, very sources of Europe, Western man, the very sand slipping, three esses sans écrit. Three esses, three esses, ecos escritos, es grito. Again then, fercaire. S1 in the automobile beside S2, S3 at the wheel, sister, furtive, slave-like movements, escape from, 
to what, where? But who can drive? Of course, S3 remembers, tells S1, hears, inserts the key, and demonstrates. S3 learns, starts the motor. Of course, escape. With drugs, oh, wild and steering slave through furtive traffic, changing lanes, exchanging places. Of course, escape. Sruti hears, Smriti recalls, Sastra learns from an other. S drive and drive, Fracare, S Fracare, Viavahara, a performance, Viavahara, the S sound of abandon. Or, again, Sastra, nay, furtive slave, learned, furtive from Sruti, nay, furtive slave, heard, furtive from Smriti. Nay, furtive slave, remembers furtive from the small sea of history, the big sea of capital, first squirt of legend, transcendental quill and myth ink, rib stain here first, no ear, no hearing, across which sheets first defined smear. I remember Smriti in the dictionary, fair care. Fast women in cars escape with drugs like Texas, but this is Berlin to Paris, night rides, hard writing, off course, three women, S's written off across this old sad continent, fast S's, stained fast essences, the S's senses, S sense of woman defilement. Some big Dichtung, this place, ace. London, 1988. Thanks, David. Uh, uh, I was talking to David about um, my favorite collection of Alfreds. Um, and it's hard to choose because each one um, just resonates for me in, um, in its own unique way. Uh, but I've always had a really strong att attachment to the House of the Blue Bed. Uh, and I think it's because it, when it was hot off the presses, Alfred gave me a copy, as he usually did uh, when I would go to visit him during office hours. He would always hand me um, a copy of an article that he had just published or book, his, one of his books. Uh, and I was always taken by that. I always thought that it was uh, you know, just very generous of him, as I was saying before. Uh, but The House of the Blue Bed, for me, um, it, it, it crosses genres in a lot of ways. Uh, the, book is, uh, the book consists of uh, what could be called short stories um, or even narrative poems. And each one of the pieces um, relates to one another in really interesting ways. So that even though um, each of the entries can stand alone, uh, there's a way in which the book as a whole tells um, a somewhat coherent narrative, but I wouldn't call it a coherent narrative, but it just, it's just that it hangs together in the sense that Alfred's telling a story um, and each one of the entries um, contributes to this a larger narrative uh, that constitutes the book. Uh, and so the piece that I want to read um, is a chapter entry poem uh, entitled Gun. Uh, and this follows on his um, recounting uh, of, of being at the Chicano Moratorium at Belvedere Park in East Los Angeles, uh, where he had been sent to uh, report on the incidents or on the incident of the, um, the protest, which was uh, taking a stand against the war in Vietnam. And Alfred uh, talks about how he had um, resisted um, uh, going to Vietnam uh, by entering, by enrolling in school, and then also working at the LA coroner's office. And so um, this poem is preceded by um, the entry uh, titled Signs, which is about the death of, the, the death of Ruben Salazar, uh, the noted LA Times reporter. And then before that, he talks about his role as working in the coroner's office and being exposed to dead bodies. So there's, a, I think each one of these uh, entries is connected through the theme of death. Uh, so let me just read you a uh, gun. So when the police had my daughter in an assassination position, kneeling gun to her head, I took care to choose and phrase my words precisely. I pulled into the driveway when Junior, son of the deaf couple next door, ran up to me saying the police had Marisol at the end of the block. I wonder about Junior's self-articulation, being as he was mixed, half Chicano, but raised completely without the sound of parental words in any language. 
There were two policemen, a man and a woman, Anglos both. The man had the pistol at my daughter's head. My wife came up to me as I reached the scene. Both policemen watched us speak, watched the brief exchange by what was taken for an irrational Mexican mama and whoever I was to prove to be. I never did write the article about the police riot and the destruction on Whittier Boulevard that culminated in the deaths of Gilberto Diaz, Lynn Ward, and Ruben Salazar. The LA Free Press, radical journal that it was, had had plenty of eyewitnesses and analysis. So in the face of such quantity, there is no need for any peace or for my peace. A week before it did run a piece of mine that described an upcoming demonstration, what was to become the largest Chicano protest against the war. But the description of the event itself, of the chaos and the killing, I did not write because of a loss of faith. You see, the news reports, especially those on television lied, not merely slanted in bias, but outright lied about wild Chicano radicals and innocent peace officers. I lost faith in truth and the hard link between world and event. So I extended what police want, absolute acquiescence. It was a small price for my daughter's brain left intact. I addressed the pig in my very best rational, liberal, humanist, Protestant work ethic, individualist, law-abiding and God-fearing all-American speech. I put to test the PhD in years of watching television. I did my best to speak to my daughter out of I did best to speak my daughter out of insignificance and to move her image in his mind to an equivalency with that of a suburban Anglo girl of the bourgeoisie, the national icon he would be loath to kill. In the end, I spoke well but did nothing. I think that had I not lost faith as a young man in East Los Angeles. I might have lost a daughter that day in San Jose. Thank you, Ricky. That's such a scary poem. Um, and of course, signals um, what I'm not the first to remark, which is how contemporary events have merely said, uh, shown just how relevant Alfred's work remains to, to this moment almost as if he was kind of prescient. And in that respect, um, the volume read contains a long kind of speech poem, which was the address that Alfred gave at a protest against the region's decision to suspend or abolish affirmative action at the UC. And it was literally, as I was putting the finishing touches to, to this volume in the summer, last summer, um, that the regions decided 25 years after that day to um, reinstate affirmative action at the UC. So there was a sense in which the legacy of Alfred's work carried through into the present. Um, I, I read a poem um, just before Ricky in which there was a lot of language play. And as I've remarked, um, Alfred was keen to integrate into his writing the legacy of Aztec writing and also of the, the Nomata language. Um, the, the title of the book, Shikan Quicatl, comes from one of the cantos. It means basically Shikano song, um, Quicatl meaning song in, in Nahuatl. Um, and I thought just to kind of complete the arc of Alfred's writing and the many modes of his writing, I read the last section of the middle sequence in Frozen Accident. Frozen Accident was the last volume that uh, Alfred saw into print himself. Although um, in 2008, almost days after he died, my small press, Cus Books, produced his last volume, posthumous volume, Act Zero. And I was deeply regretful that he never got to hold it in his hands. So Frozen Accident really is a kind of, it, it's the kind of final monument to his work as he was able to see it through in, in his own life. And it is in, in a large sense, a meditation on the relation of Europe and California, and is also a meditation on the end of Europe. Literally the west coast of California appears in this volume across the three sequences as a kind of limit point to Europe itself. 
And what he does in this central poem, which is called Netzo al Koyotl in Michlan, is to bring together a kind of tradition of European poetry that runs from Virgil, or indeed from Homer, through Virgil, through into Dante, in which the poet descends into an underworld led by a guide who, as I've mentioned, is Sheritzin or Shiri Muraga. And uh, Michlan is the Aztec word for the underworld, for Hades. And Netzoalcoyotl is, of course, uh, known as the last of the great king poets or prince poets of that tradition, and was known to have produced a tremendous uh, volume of Floricanto, um, which is the Spanish translation of the Nahuatl diffrasism or, or two-part expression for poetry, flower and song. And uh, Nesahualcoyotl um, does not appear as such, and nor is the poem tied to any specific uh, of his verses, as far as I could tell, reading the remains that, that have been translated into English and Spanish while I was doing the editing. But this last poem, um, it comes at the end of a journey which seems to take him from a kind of ghost city of San Francisco into this frozen northern land. And he uses in the poem a lot of uh, Aztec and Mayan uh, geomancy and sense of the orientations of the four points and so forth. And uh, he is led by Seretzin from Atlamatini, who was a sage or philosopher in the Aztec tradition, um, to the, the final limit of this land. And the poem is called, uh, and this of course struck me, Mari Uge. Um, Mari Uge was the Quebecois poet um, whom he, he mentioned several times and who died at the age of 25 from leukemia, if I remember correctly. And uh, you can actually see a documentary about her in which she speaks all the way through about her poetry. She had published three volumes, one of which she quotes in French towards the end of this poem. Um, reading and rereading as I was editing, and also just for pleasure, this poem, I, I think it is you know, one of the extraordinary achievements of the first decade of this millennium. So I'll just give you a sampling here. Mari Uge. Sheritzin takes me from the Tlamatini, leads to where white sand stops cold, to where white heaps snow cold below dunes of cold fog spill one last exit, to where there in the snow the face of a woman lies, perfect face, this poet. Dark hair, pale lips, and a white skin, lost in snow. Sheritzin kneels and lets red hair drape over the cold face and across, presses her lips to hers. The eyes open, the face speaks to my guide of me. Son corps est un point fils. But here, in Michelin, life beyond, she gathers petals from three rivers, for songs and sings to me. Je vous porte dans vos silences historiques. Beyond the whole wave, the dead and real, bercé, revêtu par la blancheur infernale du jour, the frozen coordinates of flame, and the true. And yet I pause before the perfect face and ask if she is probable, not fact, but true, and if her breath is bright fog or verbal reflection of codex ink and Sheritzin's body marks, a floricanto of life beyond. She whispers in my ear, Sheritzin exhales fog and steps back, back in the brilliant white, and I cup snow in my David, I was wondering if um, we could, uh, to maybe um, wrap up here, uh, turn to uh, some of Alfred's uh, scholarly work uh, to kind of show how his poetry is intimately connected to his intellectual inquiry. Um, and so I recently, I just for this event, reread uh, his book, Chicano Poetics, which David had mentioned earlier. 
And um, I was focused on uh, the chapter, Another Tongue, which interestingly is also the title of the anthology that Alfred uh, produced in which David has an essay. Uh, and there's also a really fantastic interview with Gayatri Spivak, which continues to have, um, I think, a significant impact on G scholars of Chicano literature and, and Chicano, Chicano, Chicanx studies in general, uh, because of the way that it understands Chicanos in relation to post-colonialism um, and post-colonial discourse. Uh, but I'm just gonna read a paragraph from the chapter, Another Tongue, um, where he talks about uh, two poems, one by Jose Montoya and the other one by Jose Antonio Burciaga. Um, and he writes, El Louis and Poema en Tres Idiomas y Calo are born of a linguistic interplay that finds its central analog in the porous frontier. Mexicans negotiate the border like no others, north and south, south and north, realizing, realizing simultaneous cultural uh, fission and fusion. It is this border context that differentiates the styles of linguistic interplay of Chicano poetry from other styles of polyglot poetics. The poetry of Eliot and Pound, for example, incorporates other languages from the Italian of Dante to German conversation to Chinese characters. The poetics of Montoya and Burciaga is similar to Eliot and Pound's in the fact of its linguistic hybridization, but the fact of the border con contributes to a different emphasis in the styles of that multilingualism. In Eliot and Pound, there is much greater emphasis on quotation and literary allusion while in Montoya and Burciaga, poetic hybridization tends to replicate the polyglot style of quotidian Chicano discourse. The former often focuses on the content of that form, for example, Dante's Inferno, an interlarge significant text. The later focuses on the form of that form, for example, Galo, hybridization itself, and implements discursive interaction. So I think from that passage alone, you can kind of see um, how you know, these other poets that he's engaged with um, in ways that are obvious um, in the poem that David just read are also informing the way that he's contextualizing Chicano poetry um, in this critical discourse in terms of thinking about uh, the multilingualism of, of Chicano literature and the integration of languages um, and histories and cultures as they relate to uh, figures like Eliot and Pound, which I just found always brilliant the way that Alfred was always able to just you know, just glide across different historical and cultural traditions um, and do it in such a way that just that um, didn't seem um, in the way that he's talking about poetry, you know, it was just kind of this very um, smooth transition from one tradition to another. Sorry, I'm can the scholar speak. Um, so I was struck by by his criticism, partly, I think, Ricky, because he's perfectly willing to integrate commentary on his own poems yeah. among, um, you know, writing about Bursiaga or Montoya or um, Maraga or Anzaldúa. I mean, he, he will just insert one of the cantos and then riff on it for a while. And what's so interesting is that that really is not a poet's narcissism. <laughs> it, it really is a gesture towards how he thinks about his poetry as belonging to a wider field of new world writing where what comes together is a tradition of Spanish language writing through Soruana with a tradition of indigenous writing with the tradition specifically of Chicano writing which in, in a sense is, is reflected in the title of, of Bursiaga's poem. Um, what I found fascinating in Alfred's critical work was the ease and what, what, you, what you read really demonstrates that to me, the ease with which he was able to communicate quite difficult concepts from literary theory and make them make sense in relation to a vernacular and almost in a vernacular. I always felt that, you know, Alfred, Alfred sort of talked back to him. It, was, it wasn't like it was a theoretical language. It was just how he spoke. And, and there was a way in which he had that relationship to theoretical work of complete ease and fluency um, that, that constantly manifested itself. 
and I, I don't know how that came across in his teaching, which is another thing that, that I'm interested in, in hearing more about, because clearly he was formidably intelligent and probably quite intimidating if one came across him as an undergraduate, and yet capable of communicating and sustaining and nurturing at the same time. I think you hit it right on the nose, which is that he was able to translate um, complex theoretical ideas um, in a way that made absolute sense by showing uh, through examples of popular culture um, or um, as he says uh, in the passage that I said, uh, that I just read, uh, quotidian uh, Chicano experience, um, how these, these theoretical concepts play out um, in an everyday, um, on an everyday level. Uh, and so I, I felt like I, I learned so much from him uh, I actually did an independent study with him reading uh, Gayatri Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak? Um, and uh, we would meet at uh, Cafe Milano on Bancroft, which is where he usually held office hours. And one of the most rewarding things about that, um, about him holding office hours there, is that he always seemed to draw so many people and there would always be just a, a congregation of people from, from different walks of life, you know, from the cafe workers to graduate students and undergraduates who wanted to drop by and have a conversation with him uh, to uh, colleagues of his. Um, and I think that example just shows um, how he was able to communicate across different divides. Um, and that you know, really informed the way that he understood theory as, as, as not something that was impenetrable, a language that was impenetrable, uh, but a way to understand how, um, how, that, how things operate on, a, on an everyday level. Um, and you know, his teaching style was just was very open-ended um, and I thought probably the most productive pedagogical approach that one could take because through that dialogic um, encounter, that conversation, you know, people were able to learn from him and each other. And he just you know, had this brilliant skill in, in being able to orchestrate uh, conversations that moved in and out of theory and uh, just regular conversations about life. I mean, Rick, it's, it's just struck me uh, that there was something about Alfred that went along with his interest in the Renaissance, um, which is that in some respects, he was that kind of Renaissance man who loved the sprezzatura, as Yeats used to say, of, of courtly conversation. And, and that capacity just to engage in open-ended discourse and to do so with... Um, not only enormous ease, but enormous excitement uh, that he would communicate to everybody who was around him. I did want to mention, um, since uh, we began with the small sea of Europe, that in addition to being a poet, in addition to being a critic and a teacher, Alfred also had a spell, oh, and in addition to being a journalist, Alfred also had a spell as a racing car driver, which comes up all over his poetry also. And it, it's a, a really delightful side, especially for those of us who are academics to get burrowed down into our desks. And right to the end of his life, Alfred used to love to drive and he would set off, you know, just take the, the car down to Baja or just drive across country just for the sake of it. And... Uh, it was, I think, something deeply inspirational to him. And as you said, Ricky, he, he really was a mentor who encouraged others to be creative. And I kind of wondered if we could end by asking you to read something of yours that, that Alfred, as you said, sustained. I think it would be a really nice way to, to segue into a conversation um, with everybody who's present today. Sure. Thank you, David. You, you know, I have to say uh, before I read something uh, that I haven't read my poetry in such a long time, uh, but I've been working on a book that is largely influenced by Alfred's work. Um, and my first time reading my work, interestingly, was when Alfred invited me to read with um, Luis Rodriguez and Lorna de Cervantes um, at Berkeley. Uh, he was organizing the um, weekly poetry readings in, in the Mod 5 room um, sponsored uh, through the English department. And I was this undergrad who had just started taking poetry workshops with Yusef Kumunyaka um, and had been sharing my poetry with Alfred. 
and he told me, I think you're ready. You know, you, you know, you're, I'm going to have you read with, with these two well-known poets. And it was just like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And I was a total nervous wreck, but it was probably the most uh, encouraging. And um, I don't know, it, 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 really, it really showed that Alfred had, uh, had faith in me uh, and supported my work. Um, but in any case, to just kind of wrap things up, I'm currently writing a book of poems called um, Exemplars and Accomplices, which is about my time in Chicago. Um, and it, in many ways, it is inspired by Alfred, as I said before, because of his attention to um, place and uh, travel. Um, and um, when I'm writing these poems, I see myself in conversation with him. Uh, so I'm just going to read a real short poem um, entitled Antonio, My Love. Um, Five or 50, any number will do. The dated dance music and accompanying videos keep us entertained as the suburban cowboys search for their ideal companions to bring home tonight or for good. Jose buys drinks for friends, new and old alike, the rainbow colors reflected by bottles, beer, tequila, vodka, whiskey, or wine. Adrian passionately belts out rancheras in the next room, the queen's slipping dollar bills in his tight white jeans the anticipation for a fit for a feeling of warmth on a Chicago winter night, a flirty smile or a fleeting kiss in the cramped restroom plastered with posters from last month's events. Walking an aimless mile in, is worth the promise of a temporary dream. So that's just one of, uh, of, uh, of many of these poems that I've uh, been writing, uh, reflecting on the 10 or so years that I lived in Chicago. Um, and because of Alfred, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm I'm being encouraged to go ahead and complete this uh, this book, and also just to kind of revisit the importance of poetry um, on me uh, as a writer and a scholar. So thank you for in inviting me to do that, David. Uh, no, Ricky, it was great great to hear you because I've never heard any of your poetry or even read any of your poetry. So it's a real privilege to to get to do that, and I could see Alfred grinning over your left shoulder there. <laughs> and, and also poking fun at me in the way that he usually in, did in that very um, generous and gentle way yes yes yeah, yeah. yeah. well maybe this is time john yeah i was going to say folks it might be uh, i don't know how much time we have uh, before the zoom meeting ends but i think this is a good time uh for people to ask questions feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or if you would prefer enter your question in chat and i will ask it for you uh, I just want to point out that uh, David has provided in chat a link to uh, uh, where to purchase uh, the book. Uh, so uh, that may be something some of you are interested in. Normally we'd have copies available. So please feel free to unmute and ask a question if you'd like. Go right ahead. Actually, I do have a question if I could begin with it. Do we have any recordings of Alfred reading his poems uh, anywhere? Uh, it may have been, you know, before the age of everything being available online. Actually, yes, John, we do. Um, I'm not sure what event or what occasion the, the poems came from, but his daughters put together a CD of him reading, mm -hmm. half of which is just him reading, and the other half is the same poems laid down to a beat track that I believe one of the boyfriends uh, was able to put together. Um, I don't know how available that CD is, but I do have a copy of it. And uh, also there is actually a tape of Anna Kazumi style and Alfred and myself reading the collective poem that we did, which preserves Alfred's voice beautifully. Um, and I don't know if there's some way that the library could convert both um, into sort of digital, digital form and preserve, I would be delighted if that could be done. Good. And I'm happy to share also um, with, with anybody who just wants to drop me a note, um, I, can, I can share those recordings. Um, as mp3s. Anna, I can't help asking if you have any reflections on Alfred um, since you knew him back in the day also. 
Um, let me just introduce Anna to the assembled uh, community here. Um, Anna, as I got to know Anna, was a graduate student in Complet studying German and English writing. And then um, with miraculous speed, learned not only to speak and read in Spanish, but also to become a Spanish writer and is now living in Buenos Aires where she's the prize winning author of novels and short stories and God knows what more, Anna. <laughs> so um, we all knew Alfred together and spent many good hours with him um, back in those days. So Anna, if you could unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, right, well, only someone who's been so intellectually generous with me as David could put me on the spot and still not make me feel bad. Um, it's uh, such a strange and wonderful experience to be hearing Alfred's work and words um, through your voice, David. Um, so lovely to hear you, um, Richard, Ricky, um, because when you read, I can hear him. Um, and of course, I think probably Rob also, um, at least one other person that I see from the time that um, I was a student at, um, at Berkeley, hanging out at the Cafe Milano, um, I recall, uh, this sort of um, thrill of, of listening to Alfred when he spoke, um, also when he taught, when he read, um, this sort of incredible speed, this agility, the kinetic quality of his thinking and his creativity. And I think mostly what drew me to, to him and, and to be interested and thirsty to listen to him and just watch him in action was this, almost, um, it looked like alchemy. It looked like, you know, something really uh, remarkably marvelous, magical, but actually it was just this capacity to pull together things that seemed or are often thought of as disparate and really uh, spell out, begin to make perceptible the co-constitutive, co-constructive elements in the relations. I was really drawn to his interlingual capacity in his writing because I was beginning to try to toy, toy with that myself and began to recognize almost with his enthusiasm that uh, there is possibility there and it can end up reflecting something that is not readily available in more conventional forms. So he had this incredible thrilling um, capacity and he was setting it in motion constantly, whether over french fries, over a beer, with music, with this speed car that really kind of, I confess, freaked me out as a friend because he really did uh, love it, <laughs> uh, almost more than life. Um, but yes, I thank you for the chance to share these memories. I listened to the YouTube of the previous presentation. I've listened today with that same feeling, just a commotion of things possible, and yet mixed with the sadness as well. Um, feels like a convocation though, to read him and, and to write and to speak um, at his behest. So thank you and um, Thank you, Anna. It's, it's lovely to see you again. And, and um, I don't know, it, strikes, it strikes me that, that um, Alfred is just one of those people who made things possible. And that's very much reflected in what you said. We, we have a question from uh, Gabriella. Uh, 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 can you speak more to conducting the archival research and what that process was like? Uh, how do you see uh, those moments of time preserved in the archive? Sorry, in the archive? In the archive. Can you speak more to conducting archival research uh, and what that process was like? Gabriella, if you want to unmute and ask more directly, feel free to do so. Uh, her, uh, her internet connection is unstable. 
Okay, I was just waiting for Gabriella. Um, well, this is one of the occasions where much of the archive is really informal. Um, for example, there's a, an archive of um, copies of Cantos sitting under somebody's desk that I know. There's a handful of House with a Blue Bed sitting, you know, in one of the daughters' house there. But above all, um, there are boxes of papers of Alfred's and somewhere else, a laptop that presumably contains a lot of stuff. And at this juncture, no one has really systematically gone through the materials which have not been archived in any formal sense. They're just there. And frankly, I think it's, it's too soon for the family to want to go through that process. I mean, it's only been 12 years since Alfred himself passed away. And the, the job of sorting out what's intimate and private and, and what could actually be of real use to scholars working on his texts is, is hard to say right now. Um, I went through it fairly quickly, really just in search of manuscripts of the poems that I was editing, just, just occasionally there were things I couldn't tell if they were, uh, you know, instances of compositor's error that, that should have been corrected or whether Alfred was deliberately playing. And this is one of the hard things about editing his work because sometimes he deliberately introduces error or introduces um, mis apparent misspellings that are actually puns and that sort of thing. So I was trying to establish that um, in the course of it, I came across a whole manuscript of a work that was in progress when he died that I hope some future editor will weigh up um, whether it needs a further edit that they would be willing to undertake or whether it should be published exactly as it is and so forth. These were not decisions I felt ready to make. So it's, it's an interesting experience. And I know a, a lot of my colleagues in English and, and beyond here have experience working in, in more or less informal archives, um, archives that are not, you know, housed in institutions, but are simply what maybe a community or a family has kept of people's work from behind in which an awful lot of work that could be out there in public has been stored and uh, time will tell, you know, just how much of, of Alfred's archive will be entrusted to a library somewhere. But I, I really do hope it will, because I know I just scraped the surface and managed to establish a few things that were of use to editing. But I suspect there's an awful lot more. I suspect that there is a fascinating biography to be written. And of course, those were not the materials I was looking for because I wasn't trying to do a biography, but I suspect that material is there um, in abundance, both through conversation. And I'm, I'm very much hoping that, that, you know, some graduate students, some undergraduates will want to begin the process of interviewing people who knew Alfred in order to establish um, a kind of recorded archive of memories of him and of details about his life that certainly in the time I had to edit, I was not able to, to establish or confirm. But I see Ruben has a, has a hand up there. Yeah, hi, uh, yeah, first I wanna thank you, Ricky and David for your work on this and, and for putting this together, I really appreciate this. And Ricky, I'm really excited to read your book, uh, more of your poetry. Um, I, I, my question about Alfred is, um, it really strikes me this idea of being a kind of Renaissance type and his kind of uh, how he was um, navigating and, and traversing different worlds, specifically, you know, creatively and academically. Uh, and I'm kind of piecing together a sense of, of how he did that, but I was uh, wondering if maybe um, you could talk a, a little to that from your experience of um, uh, just, uh, I guess, how he was able to be in, in both of these worlds successfully and maybe sometimes not successfully, you know, uh, based on his, the tenure experience, right, and those kind of academic pressures and how they um, impinge on, you know, e creative efforts. Um, but, but if you could maybe speak to that uh, of, of just the uh, more kind of specifics of how he was able to, to kind of maintain that creative spirit, even as he worked in 
within academia, right? Ricky, go ahead. I just think that he he refused to be boxed in or pinned down, um, and as a result, uh, you know, people didn't know how to respond to that. I think that had a lot to do with his uh, tenure denial that he didn't play one particular role that people expected him to, and he he was just so interested in in, in a number of different things and. And they weren't just mutually exclusive, as I think we've been saying, but they just overlap in, uh, uh, in generative ways. And he just refused to play by the rules, uh, which is something that I always admired about him. You know, when I found out that he wrote a dissertation on Shakespeare and Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, it was like, whoa, what's, you know, that, is that, that's possible? Um, and, you know, and then also just, you know, a, a deep historical knowledge um, of, the history of Chicano, Chicano poetry. Um, and, you know, I think it was, it was the fact that Alfred was just always guided by um, his own desires and, and what he, what, you know, what excited him. And he just refused to conform to uh, anybody's expectations about how he should categorize himself as a scholar, as a thinker. Um, um, and so I think that is kind of one of the things that I've most appreciated about Alfred is uh, just always having this, you know, passionate um, um, investment in, in knowledge um, and, um, and not listening to what other people have to say. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I, I probably shouldn't have used the term Renaissance man because Alfred would have laughed me out of the room for using a term like that. <laughs> but I think it, to, to kind of get that off its its high horse, what that really means is someone who's insatiably curious and to whom everything is interesting. And that was Alfred. And, you know, for him, whether he was writing poetry or a critical essay, what mattered to him was that impulse of curiosity to try to see what was going on, right? And then his poems were research. I mean, writing the notes from I realized just how much research he did. You know, and in all and in all kinds of areas, you know, he was sort of reading up Frida Kahlo's notebooks, and he was reading Gayatri Spivak, but then he was also, you know, tromping around Belfast, looking at Bobby Sands' grave, and that was research too. It wasn't just because it didn't take place in a library didn't mean that it wasn't actually part of the way he kept researching his world and looking for connections and so forth. And I think that sustained him all the way through. It is my sense that, that um, after Chicano Poetics was published and after his tenure battles were over, he wasn't particularly interested in writing formal criticism anymore and, and playing the academic game in that respect. But I don't think that meant in any sense that he gave up his constant intellectual reflection on things. And I, I mean, I would say in general that um, Academia does make it hard to sustain a creative writing life. And it's not because academics are dry and boring and all the things that sometimes get said. It's because anybody who's doing the work of teaching knows that that involves creative energy. And even anybody who's writing articles knows that it does take creative energy. And there's so much energy one has uh, to, to, you know, to, to produce work in either sphere. And I think that, that trying to strike that balance is, is a difficult operation and takes a considerable degree of will to maintain. But Alfred, I think, resolved it, as Ricky says, by, by just not worrying about the rules. I mean, he, he didn't feel the need to kind of dot every I and cross every T in, in academic procedures. And yet, you know, when he responds to a tenure judgment in a half a page, it's brilliant. I mean, he, he succinctly articulates exactly what happened in three lines. And, and that capacity to condense, which is, of course, dichtung, um, condensari equals dichtung. Um, the, the dichtung is, or poetry in German is concentration or condensation of things. And that was part of his gift. And that sort of elliptical way of writing and condensing stuff together is, is just so characteristic of his work.
John, uh, not to put you on the spot, but I was, I was curious to know um, about your familiarity, familiarity with Alfred, because you told me that you knew of him. At one point, we uh, tried to make a job offer uh, when he was finishing up uh, here at Riverside. And yeah, before we could even, um, we had, I think we had done MLA interviews, but before we could even bring him to campus, he had already accepted uh, Berkeley. So, uh, 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 so it was one of our, I, I have a long list, by the way, of people we've tried to hire and couldn't. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite a pantheon, uh, but that was, that was one of them. Uh, folks, I think we're, we're, we're running out of, uh, we had this time for an hour but I don't want us to necessarily uh, stop. So what I think I'm going to do is to suggest that anybody who actually has to go to class or anything else, uh, uh, feel free to log off and we will consider this the formal ending of our uh, presentation, but that those of us who want to stay online and chat, uh, uh, feel free uh, to, to do so. Uh, I, I don't think there's any limit on, on that. Uh, also, uh, let me suggest by way of ending, first, thanks to, to the Center for Ideas and Society. Thanks to Catherine Henshaw. Thanks uh, to uh, everyone else at uh, Georgia Warnke and everyone else who were so enthusiastic about co-sponsoring this with, with English. Uh, thanks to, to David and Ricky for this amazing conversation. Uh, I, I want to suggest that we might consider uh, doing a reprise of this sometime next year when the Cheech Marin um, uh, Museum of Chicano Art opens uh, in Riverside. Uh, they may not be totally physically open, but they're gonna start doing events. And it seems to me that this is not only a wonderful way to sell books, but also a way of, uh, you know, um, a, a kind of outreach and development uh, opportunity for the Cheech. Uh, those of you in Riverside, those of you who are not in Riverside probably will, will fill you in on that as it, as it develops. Uh, again, thank you all so much. And thank you uh, all of you who've uh, come in from so far away, Anna and others, thank you. And thank you, John, uh, so much for suggesting this occasion in the first place and for doing such a wonderful job in putting together our roster of, of events for this quarter. Um, can, I, can I put a word in for Emma Stapley said, let's get David to do a presentation on me. <laughs> so it was Emma who was a member of the committee who uh, decided it was originally. Well, well, thank you, John. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, John. Great to see you, Rob. Anna, let's talk soon.